America sets the trends for the world. Are you aware of that? That's a scary thought. A lot of it's because of our media industry. We pump out more movies and more television programming than anybody. I went to the Middle East and watched Gilligan speaking Arabic. <laughs> Tell you, that's a thrill. The book of Revelation pictures three angels speeding to our planet. They carry urgent messages of warning and hope to prepare us for Jesus' return. These divine prophecies provide us with a vivid window revealing future events for our world. In God's Word, a special blessing is promised for all who seek to understand these prophecies. With this in mind, Amazing Facts brings you a new revelation with Doug Batchelor. Author and TV host Doug Batchelor has thrilled thousands around the world with these fascinating presentations. This new revelation seminar is a complete Bible study the whole family will enjoy. Clear-cut logic spontaneous humor and beautifully illustrated study guides will bring the Bible to life as never before. Today's message, the USA in Bible prophecy. And now, a new revelation. I'm a returning student missionary. While I was away, I felt the Lord w working in my life. Since I've returned, I don't feel as close. How do you keep the spiritual high? How do you know that God is still with you? Be careful not to base your convictions about your relationship with the Lord on feeling. The Bible said, Jesus said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. I think that you can also rephrase that very accurately, very biblically, to say blessed are those who believe without feeling. Faith and feeling are two distinct separate things. We know that God is close to us when we invite him, and he says, I am with you always, whether you feel it or see it. The devil can make you feel things. But... As your faith strengthens, sometimes you will have periods of emotional ecstasy. You're not to seek those. You're to seek that you are in harmony with God, and then God in His Spirit will give you peace. Uh, do the things that gave you the experience the first time. Reading God's Word, sharing your faith. Um, you know, there was a, a, a gentleman who was a big influence in my life. He was a Jewish Christian. And when I was living in the cave, I met Brother Harold on the streets there in Palm Springs. He would witness to everybody that he saw. He had learned how to say God loves you in about 10 different languages so he could tell everybody in Palm Springs, because it's sort of an international city, you know. People came from all over. And he'd tell everybody. He'd wake up 4 o'clock in the morning, start reading his Bible and praying. He'd pray for hours. He knew how to speak Hebrew, Greek, Latin. Very a poor man, a very humble man, very godly man. And... Uh, he, I saw him pray one time and his face just lit up with an inner glow and I knew the Spirit of God was in him. One day he was riding, he rode a little three-wheel bicycle around Palm Springs and he was riding up the street there in Palm Drive and he saw me and he slowed down, he recognized me, he knew I was a new Christian. He said, Doug, how's your courage? I said, well, I'm okay. He said, Doug, how long can you hold your breath? And I said, oh, I can, I can hold my breath for four minutes. And uh, now that was when I smoked. You know, when I first came to the Lord, I was still smoking. Now I can hold my breath four minutes and ten seconds. I know, because Karen held me under in the jacuzzi. It's true. And uh, he said, you shouldn't go any longer than that without praying. He said, how often do you eat? I said, oh, two, three times a day. He said, that's how often you should read and meditate on God's Word. He said, what's going to happen if you don't get any exercise? I said, well, I guess I'll get weak and flabby. He said, that's what happens to your experience if you don't use it, if you don't share it. He said, you've got a physical body that has very real needs. If you neglect those needs, you suffer according to the laws. You've got a spiritual body, and the laws are just as genuine. If you neglect taking care of your spirit, you'll atrophy. If you read your Bibles, friends, often, meditate on God's Word. If you pray, if you share your faith and pray big prayers and exercise those spiritual muscles, your faith will grow. Does a baby worry about growing? Or does it simply receive what the parents supply and it will grow? If you receive what your Heavenly Father supplies, you will grow. That's all there is to it, friends. Does anyone know how God the Father began? I know they are a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but... This is a question we always get. It's a good question. I've asked it. If God made everything, who made God, right? 
and this is one that the evolutionists love to throw at people who believe in God and creation. Well, who made God? And you know what I do? I throw it right back at them. I said, well, what's your theory about how things came about? Well, I remember asking a science teacher this one. In essence, I'm going to oversimplify, but in essence, they'll say, well, the world was developed when our solar system formed and the sun blew up. Our sun developed when our universe was formed and something blew up. Um, maybe there was a supernova. Uh, our um, universe formed when these gas particles collided and blew up. And then I would say, and where'd that come from? And where did that come from? And where did that come from? And you know what they eventually say? Since it's very unscientific to say matter creates itself, they ultimately say, well, something's always existed. That's right. You pin them down, they'll always eventually say, something has always existed. Well, you got two choices, friends. There is a mystery. You can believe that we've all come as a result of gas particles that collided and blew up, or an intelligent God that's always existed. I'd like to believe that the intelligent design we see in the universe is not the result of explosions. Say amen. Yeah. Just checking, doing a sound check. Okay. Doesn't the Bible say that Jesus gave the church the keys to the kingdom? Whatever it binds on earth will be bound in heaven, etc. This seems to give the disciples, at least, a lot of authority. Maybe that's why the Catholics believe the priests have the power to forgive sins, excommunicate, etc. I have never heard a reasonable answer to this perplexing text. Well, I'm sorry that you haven't heard a reasonable answer. I've never felt the text was that perplexing. Did Jesus give the church authority? Yes. Did he give the church keys? Yes. Did he give the keys just to Peter? No. The church has keys to unlock the prisons. Jesus came to set the captives free. The gospel is a key that liberates. It's a serum that heals. The things you bind on earth, and you know what it's talking about, binding on earth? It's like when you're baling hay to put it in the barn. So you're talking about for the harvest. It's talking about God has given us an instrument to use that will have heavenly results. Didn't Jesus say, where's your treasure? Are you storing treasure now here on earth? Are you storing treasure for heaven? Same principle. Just use Jesus' other words to explain that. He's talking about storing treasure in heaven. What is that treasure? Money? No, you're going to walk on gold there. It's souls that are saved. That's the power God has given the church. That's why he trained the apostles to win souls, not to decide who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, unless they're using their power to say, well, I think I'll share the gospel with that one. I won't share it with that one. But we're told to go to whosoever will, right? Everybody. Shouldn't we keep Sunday because Jesus rose on the first day of the week? Well, it's true that Jesus rose early Sunday morning, but I'm waiting for someone to produce a commandment where God tells us to make that the new Sabbath. Uh, what day of the week did Jesus die on the cross? Friday. Friday. Is Friday an important day for Christians? When he laid down his life for our sins, is it a new Sabbath? What day did the Lord institute the communion service? Thursday night. Thursday evening. What we would call Thursday evening. Is that a new sacred day? I mean, Jesus did important things many different days. But Jesus is the one who picked the seventh day. He even kept it in his death. He died when he said, it is finished, it's Friday afternoon. He went to sleep. He finished his work of work saving and redeeming man. Then he laid down and rested through the Sabbath in the tomb. He woke up to continue his work in our behalf as our heavenly high priest. There's nothing in the resurrection that tells us it's a new Sabbath. If anything, it would be the opposite. He continued working. How do you prove that the rich man and Lazarus story is only a parable? In other parables, the Bible actually calls them a parable, but it does not call the rich man and Lazarus story a parable. Well, I'd respectfully disagree. There's a lot of parables in the Bible that Jesus doesn't call a parable. Uh, and how do we know the rich man and Lazarus is a parable? Well, just a little deductive reasoning will tell you that we're not all going to Abraham's bosom. You think everybody in this room would fit in Abraham's bosom if we're all saved? That's obviously a, an allegory, a metaphor. The Bible says that the people in heaven and hell in this parable are talking to each other. How many here want to believe that's true? That's just what I thought. Obviously, it's a parable. The Bible says there in Luke chapter 16 that uh, he says, please send Lazarus that he might touch my tongue with one drop of water because I'm tormented in this flame. Would a drop of water comfort somebody burning in hell? A drop of water wouldn't help me if I was mowing the lawn on a summer day. And so obviously, it's, there's so many allegories and metaphors in here to take that literally is is very difficult to do could you please explain the prophecies in Daniel 12 the 1260 days and 1335 days 
You're asking me to explain the chapter in the Bible that has more time prophecies than any other, Daniel chapter 12. Let me tell you in a nutshell, you can look it up and read the whole chapter, I believe in something called multidimensional prophetic interpretation. What that means is one prophecy of God may not be just flat with one interpretation. I believe one prophecy can have many interpretations as long as they do not conflict. I believe many of the prophecies in Revelation had historical interpretation. I also believe that they can have a literal application without being conflicting. Proof of this is where Jesus, Matthew 24, talks about his second coming. They asked him three questions. They asked, what will be the signs of your coming, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the end of the world? He answered all three of those questions with one essay, with one presentation. Because the same answer about the destruction of Jerusalem also applies not only to what happened to them, but it applies to God's people in the last days. I told you last night, there in Revelation, it says in chapter 13, one of the heads of the beast would receive a deadly wound and the deadly wound would heal. Historically, that happened in 1798. Quite literally, it happened in this generation with the present pope. He was wounded with a critical wound, the wound was healed, and then he traveled more to more countries than any pope in history. And all the world received him. I mean, you know, so that's another example of that. Daniel 12, I believe, not only has a historical application, but there may be a literal application because Daniel 12 begins with Michael standing up, time of trouble, resurrection. Last thing it says in the last verse of Daniel is you will rest in your lot till the end of the days. That meaning he would sleep and come to life. And I think there may be a literal application to those prophecies in Daniel 2. We're going to show some slides tonight on the subject of the plagues. And I may even allude to that a little bit then. Why didn't God destroy Lucifer earlier on in time? Would it not be better if Lucifer was destroyed before he deceived more people? Uh, the Lord needed to allow him to completely develop what his government would be so that sin would never rise up again the second time. Uh, in love, he had to allow Lucifer to demonstrate what selfishness leads to. Our planet is going to self-destruct when Jesus comes. And it's because of Lucifer's government. It's because of selfishness. If God had destroyed Lucifer too soon, the other creatures in the universe would have had doubts about God's justice and maybe would have started believing Lucifer's claims. What is meant by pagan Rome and papal Rome? What is the difference? Well, you hear me refer to pagan Rome. Pagan Rome was the Roman Empire ruled by people like Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, Justinian, the Caesars, Roman soldiers. Papal Rome is when pagan Rome, ruled by Caesars, began to deteriorate. Rome started losing its power, divided into ten kingdoms. But the Holy Roman Empire had control of those ten kingdoms. That was papal Rome. Does the Bible say, once saved, always saved? Well, no, you don't find the statement, once saved, always saved, in the Bible. And I would have to respectfully submit, I don't think you find the teaching that once a person is saved, they can't be lost in the Bible either. I believe the Bible has a number of examples of people who were saved, filled with the Spirit, and then, for whatever reason, turned away from the Lord and were lost. You know, we always think about Judas, the scoundrel he was, but keep in mind, Jesus said, have I not chosen the twelve of you, and one of you is a devil. He knew what Judas would develop into, but didn't Jesus send out the twelve? And the twelve came back and reported that even the devils were subject unto them. Judas had a good side that was stirred by the Holy Spirit at times. Judas went out preaching about Jesus. Judas, Judas went out working miracles. But he began to grieve away the Holy Spirit. What about Balaam the prophet? Wasn't he a prophet of God at one point? But then he grieved away the Holy Spirit and he died a lost man. What about Saul? Saul was a king anointed and filled with the Holy Spirit by God, but he began to be impressed with himself, proud. He grieved away the Holy Spirit and he took his own life, just like Judas took his own life. Um, the Bible says there in Revelation, speaking about the messages to the seven churches, counsel is, if you do not repent, I'll remove your candlestick out of its place, speaking to Christians in churches. Now, I'll tell you why once saved, always saved is a dangerous doctrine. Some sincere people believe once you come to the Lord, you know, you fall on your knees to say a certain prayer, you're saved, you can't be lost no matter what you do. Oh, I think the devil loves that. Of course you can be lost. What that teaches is that God takes away your choice. Now, the reason the doctrine once saved, always saved developed is people don't want to think, I'm saved today, I'm lost tomorrow, I'm saved the next day, I'm lost the next day. Roller coaster experience up and down. How many of you get tired of that? Wondering, am I saved? Will I be lost? I don't worry about that. I have an assurance that God is going to finish what he started in my life. Amen. 
It's based upon faith and love. Now, when Karen and I got married, we made some decisions and took some very restrictive vows. And sometimes I'm out of town or she's away. I'm free to break those vows. I don't worry about doing it and I don't worry about her doing it based on mutual love and faith. We have assurance based on mutual love and faith. You can have that in your relationship with the Lord. See what I'm saying? And so that's what it is. But the idea that once you're saved, you can't be lost takes away your free choice. Of course you can. Read what Peter says about the pig that was washed that returns to wallowing in the mire. There's just a number of statements. Do you know God saved Sodom and Gomorrah before he destroyed them? That's right. Lot and all of Sodom and Gomorrah were carried away by Chedorlaomer and the kings of the north, and Abraham delivered them. He saved them. But then they persisted in sin, and God destroyed them. The angels were once saved, and then they were cast into darkness and everlasting chains. God saved the children of Israel from Egypt, but a lot of them stopped believing they died in the wilderness, right? The Bible is full of examples of this. It's not a biblical teaching. Okay. And Go ahead. Does the Pope know that he's the Antichrist? He I should don't be know. an intelligent man. I'm sure he is. I, I, he speaks seven languages. He's probably very intelligent. I'd like to think that he doesn't see himself in that light. Uh, as I said before, we're not talking about the individual. Nebuchadnezzar was the leader of Babylon, which is a beast in prophecy that persecuted God's people, and he'll be in, ki in the kingdom. I hope everyone here is clear. I'm not judging the individual. I have no idea what his relationship with the Lord is. Uh, from what I see on the outside, he seems to be a very pious man. You want the last question? Yeah, I think we're running out of time. How do we know that the 1,000 years of the millennium are 1,000 literal years? Why don't we use the same year-day principle for interpreting this time period as we do for all the others? Good question. Let's suppose that a day does equal a year. If we're going to spend 360,000 years in heaven with God, that's okay with me. But the reason we believe it's a literal 1,000 years, the millennium begins when eternity begins. It begins with the coming of Jesus. You do not any longer need that prophetic principle of a day for a year. Also, when the millennium begins, it's after the angel says, time shall be no more, speaking of prophetic time. And so, for that and some other reasons, we believe it is a literal 1,000 years. Glad to see so many of you coming back night after night. You know, you've been very dedicated in your studies, and uh, we have a lesson tonight. You're going to hear some things and maybe see some things you've not seen before. The USA, our beloved country, in Bible prophecy. Question number one. We're going to do a little review here as we move into the second beast of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 11. We always talk about the mark of the beast. Revelation indeed talks about two beasts. Two world powers are symbolized in Revelation 13. What is the first power? What did we discover? The first power is this beast with seven heads and ten horns. It's none other than the Roman papacy. Or the, the Roman Catholic Church is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13. Certainly an international power that had a tremendous amount of influence all through the Dark Ages from 538 to 1798. They held an almost uh, absolute sway over the former Roman Empire. But they received a deadly wound. And what did they get wounded with? You know, it says they received a deadly wound with a sword. What's the sword? Hebrews chapter 4 tells us the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know what caused the great wound? It wasn't so much Napoleon as it was the Reformation. Many, many people began to flock out of the church during the Reformation because the Bible was placed back in the hands of the people. You know, it's very interesting. One of the first times the Bible was printed in the language of the people was Martin Luther's German Bible, and it so happened to be also the very first book printed on a modern printing press. It's almost as though God allowed Gutenberg to develop this printing press for the purpose of circulating the Word of God throughout the world. Up until then, they had to handwrite the Bibles. Number two, in what year was the papacy predicted to lose its world influence and power? Well, we read there, power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. The starting point for their existence was when they received an army. And the Bible says in, Re in Daniel 7, the little horn plucks up three horns. That all happened in 538. The Pope was given an army by Justinian. He began to battle against the Arians, the Heruli, Ostrogoths, and Vandals to root them out of the kingdom. And this is exactly what happened during that period of time. Number three. Which nation is predicted to arise around the same time the papacy was receiving a deadly wound? Now, what time did the papacy receive a deadly wound? 1798. 
One world power was coming into priority and visibility during that time. You tell me. No question about it, the United States. Now keep in mind, people say, now wait, Doug, the United States was 1776? No, the Declaration was 1776. England did not recognize us as being independent then. We were just kind of flexing our muscles and rattling our swords and saying, we want to be independent. Then we had to fight a war. And it wasn't until 1798 that the other nations of the world said, you know, it seems like those rebels in North America had finally broken away from the mother in England and they were an independent country to be dealt with. Up until that time, they still tried to look to England to find out how to deal with America because they thought, what if America loses the war? But it wasn't until 1798 that the United States was really recognized by the other nations of the world as an independent entity to be dealt with. Benjamin Franklin was one of the first ambassadors that began to go overseas. He was also a genius in his own right. You know, he spoke seven languages. Brilliant man. Had a great influence on our government. One of my heroes. This other beast rises up out of the earth. Two horns like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. Now what, what is a lamb a symbol of in Revelation? Behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What's a lamb a symbol of? Jesus. What's a dragon a symbol of? Well, we read there in Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon is the Roman Empire being pushed by that old serpent, the devil, and Satan, okay? Now here, this country is going to have characteristics of a lamb and the Roman dragon. You notice it says two horns like a lamb, the lamb first. Keep in mind when you're reading prophecy, some people think because you read it in one second, that's how long it takes to happen. When you're reading prophecy, God sees in a timeline of hundreds of years. Sometimes in one or two verses, God will cover a thousand years. And you've got to just look at the context there. What is the significance of the beast coming up out of the earth? You notice, where did the other beast come up out of in Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 13? Came up out of what? The sea, out of the water. And the water represents the existing places where God's people had been. The cradle of civilization, multitudes of people, nations, and tongues. But now this beast is the only beast that comes up out of the earth. It's like God had provided a new land for his people to move to. You know, something very interesting that I've observed. Do you know the revivals in the Bible seem to circle from east to west like the sun moving its light across the planet? God called, you know, the uh, Abraham and I'm sorry, Adam and Eve were there in Mesopotamia. And then uh, the ark settled there in the, the Sinar, or mountains of Ararat, rather, and then the Tower of Babel, God's people settled there, and then Abraham was called from there to Canaan, and that was the cradle of revival for many years, and then the Jews were scattered west through the Roman Empire, and it seemed like the gospel moved with Paul and Peter to Rome, and then revival started moving to Spain and France, and then to England, and then to North America, and you know, now it's wrapping around the other side of the country. Now it's settling in Sacramento, actually. But then it's going to keep on going. And you know the gospel's going to China now? And it's almost like you're watching Jesus' prophecy being fulfilled. And he said, the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in all the world for the witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. The gospel is literally sweeping around the world just before Jesus comes. But America provided a fresh culture. And with all due respect to our Native American friends, I used to live... Uh, on the reservation. Matter of fact, we live by a reservation right now in Northern California, right on the border. Our property fence, across the fence, is the reservation. And, uh, but I still think that the Bible is telling us that compared to the densely civilized areas that were in Europe, where God's people had had an influence, this was a new place for them to grow. It provided a new government and a new place for them to exercise their liberties. Number five. What is symbolized by the two lamb-like horns and absence of crowns? Well, obviously a crown means that the horns that had crowns were monarchies, which is typically what you found there in Europe. But this new power has two horns like a lamb, but no crowns. How come? Because for once you had, do you know they wanted to make George Washington a king? How many of you know that? As soon as they won the Revolutionary War, they said, let's make you king. He said, not on your life. I'm sure glad he said that. He said, we just got away from a despot. He said, you want to do that again? 
He said, let's have a democracy. And they debated on how to do that for quite a while. And of course, then we'd established our constitution and decided to be a democracy. The two horns that gave our country strength was freedom of religion and freedom of government. Freedom for the people to choose their own religion, freedom for the people to choose their own government. A nation without a pope and a nation without a king. That's what gave them their strength, their power. Horns in the Bible represent power. Now, some of the other horns there represented individual nations. And I've heard some, some say, Doug, if you want to be consistent with that, wouldn't that mean that it was the United States and Canada? Well, you know, if you wanted to argue that, I probably would not spend a lot of time with you because it's, it's, it could be argued. But whatever it is, the United States provided a new fertile ground for Christianity to grow. Now, friends, I'm not being biased to my country. The fact is that the United States sponsors mission work around the world more than any other country. Are you aware of that? We send out and finance more mission work than any other country in the world. So this did become a cradle for Christianity. It became a place where Protestantism could really flourish for a while because there was a lot of persecution from the Church of England and the Church of Rome in Europe. And you know, for a little while, there was a little persecution here. Till, uh, a man named Roger Williams came along and said, we need to have freedom of religion. Do you know that uh, the first communist country in the world was North America? Are you aware of that? The pilgrims were communists? Ooh, I'm going to catch it now. Watch the questions coming tomorrow. You know why they almost starved to death the first two years they were here? They had a common garden. They said, let's all live in the communal. That, they didn't share wives and things, but they, they did share gardens. And they said, let's all just have, you know, one big family. But since it was everybody's garden, nobody worked in it. And almost 50% of them died the first winter. Finally, when they decided, well, every person have their own garden, they started working a little harder in their own garden. Communism failed miserably at the infancy of our country. A small experiment with communism. So the two horns represent freedom of religion, freedom of government. Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I hope you're learning new things from today's study. If you are, I'd like very much to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, your comments, and especially your prayer requests. Our office staff at Amazing Facts gathers every day to pray over each one of them. If you'd like to know more about how to obtain this video series, you can call us or write. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. And our toll-free number is 1-800-835-6906. Why don't you give us a call or write us a letter? God bless you, and I thank you in advance. Number six, what does it mean when the prophecy in Revelation 13, 11 says, America will speak as a dragon? Well... It's talking about speaking like the dragon speaks earlier in the same chapter. Now, think about something, friends. Can you see Roman influence in North America? How many of you have been to Washington, D.C.? Anyone here been to our nation's capital? I've been there several times. Do they use early Inca American architecture? Is it Aztec? Is it Chinese? What architecture do you see all over Washington? Roman architecture. What kind of government have we emulated? You know where the word Senate comes from? Rome. And I think some of it springs back from Greece, but the, the Romans also adopted that. So much of our government, so much of our educational system, our time. You know where the idea of measuring days from midnight came from? In the Bible, when did they start and end a day? Sundown. The Romans are the ones who said, we're going to figure the middle of the night and that would be the beginning of a new day. You know where our calendar comes from? From Rome. July is named after Julius Caesar. Now you know why there's a month called August? Named after Augustus Caesar. 
You know why February is so short? Because Augustus Caesar was offended that Julius Caesar had a month with 31 days, and he only had a month with either 29 or 30 days, I forget, and so he took days off of February and added it to August. The Romans really fooled with the calendar quite a bit. And so that's where we get our, our calendar. Do you know why Christmas is celebrated on the um, 25th, uh, 25th of December? Is everyone here aware that Jesus was not born the 25th of December? Now, don't be concerned that Pastor Doug is going to steal your Christmas right now. That's not my objective. I just want you to be intelligent about that, okay? If you're going to do something, at least know what you're doing. I hope you're not telling your children about Santa Claus and the elves. Amen? But the Bible tells us that Christ ministered three and a half years. We know that he began his ministry at his baptism. We don't know, and the Bible says his baptism was about his 30th birthday. He was like a high priest, could not minister until his 30th birthday. When Jesus had his 30th birthday, he went down to the Jordan. He got baptized, started his ministry. We know when he died. He died in the spring during Passover. Isn't that right? Subtract three and a half years or even six months of work, and you know that he was born in the fall. The Bible says that the shepherds were out in the field watching their flocks, right? I've been to Palestine. You're not out in the field December 25th with your flocks. And there's a number of other, you can do a little detective work and you can know. Well, you know why we picked that? Is because when there was a merging of paganism and Christianity in Rome, trying to reach more of the pagans, they said, well, we don't know exactly when Jesus was born. They had a festival. It was a special day of the sun, the, the winter solstice, when the days got the shortest. You know, most Roman worship, matter of fact, most pagan worship revolves around sun worship. The Inca Indians, Babylonians, Romans, uh, the Egyptians all worship the sun. And you can understand because so much of the power and life in the world comes from the sun. Well, the sun kept getting lower and lower on the horizon. The days kept getting shorter. And finally, around the 25th of December was the first day they noticed that the days were getting longer. The winter solstice is about the 21st. The days stay the same for 22nd, 23rd, 24th. You notice them visibly getting longer. The 25th, it was a big celebration. They would have evergreen trees because they never lost their leaves, a sign of eternal life. They dance around the trees and they give each other gifts. And they said, let's call this the birthday of Jesus. And that's how a lot of these things came into Christmas that were really nowhere in the Bible. It came from Roman culture. And so you'd be amazed how much Roman culture has influenced North America. But you know what's going to happen? America is going to make laws forcing people how they should worship and believe just like it happened during the Dark Ages. And you're thinking, oh, Doug, that would never happen. You've not been listening. You've not been watching what's going on. Have you noticed how much influence religion is now having in politics lately? We're moving rapidly towards a government that is going to be manipulated by religious interests. And I think it's going to get much worse than anyone can imagine because there's some factors that we don't know about. I think a financial travesty could really cause an upheaval in our country. Incidentally, do you know how Napoleon came into power in France? On the heels of an economic disaster. Do you know how Adolf Hitler came into power in Germany? On the heels of economic disaster. Almost all totalitarian dictatorships have come into power on the heels of economic disaster. The stock market has been zooming. Economists are shuddering. They say, hey, it's great, we're making money, but it's not going to last. There's going to be a major correction, and it could bring us back to the time of the Great Depression or worse. Economists are saying that you got two trains on the same track heading towards each other. The question is not will they collide, but when. Some of you have read the book or heard of the book by uh, Larry Burkett, financial author, who said it's called, I believe, Coming Economic Crisis or Earthquake. What's it called? Economic Earthquake is coming. And uh, he also, and a number of others, recognize this thi these things that are, that are coming. And so if there's a great financial disaster, you know what people do when they're afraid? You know how much church attendance goes up when people are afraid? And I think there could be a fear factor. Natural disasters, plagues the Bible talks about. I'm not even speaking of the seven last plagues. People go flocking to the churches. And then when the religious leaders say, this is what you want to do. God is punishing us because we don't go to church. We're going to make a law that everyone goes to church. It'll save our families, deliver us from crime. And everyone's going to say, yes, hallelujah, amen. And if you stand up and say, no, wait a second, this isn't right, you're going to look like the oddball. And you're going to be persecuted. When everyone else is bowing down to the golden image, if you stand up, 
you're going to be a party pooper and you're not going to be popular even if you're standing with the Lord. These things are coming, friends. What specifically will America do that causes it to speak as a dragon? How does a government speak? A government speaks with its legislation, with its laws. America, believe it or not, it's prophesied is going to speak like the dragon. It's going to make an image to the beast. Now, what's an image? An image is not a statue. Man is made in the image of God. It doesn't mean man is made in the statue of God. People think that there's going to be this great big statue somewhere everyone's going to bow to. Your children are your image. When you look in a mirror, you see your image. It's a reflection. It's a likeness. Well, friends, in the last days, the United States is going to make a government. They're going to make laws, rather, that will resemble, that will imitate, that will be an image of laws that were in existence during the Dark Ages telling people how and who to worship how, who, and when to worship. And it's going to be very, very difficult for those who want to put God first in their lives. I guarantee these things are going to happen. Indeed, they're happening right now. Let me tell you what I believe is going to happen. I believe because of fear, Protestants, Charismatics, sometimes called Evangelicals, Protestants and Charismatics and Catholics, in North America, and again, I'm not slandering, I am technically a Protestant. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just telling you what I think the facts are. Protestants, Charismatics, and Catholics <clears throat> are going to unite on the points they hold in common and push the governments of North America to make laws on the points they have, hold in common to try and save society. How many of you have heard rumblings of this already in the news and in the magazines? I saw a Newsweek magazine recently. Uh, dealing with, can the church save America? And this is the emphasis of people like Jerry Falwell and Ralph Reed and, and uh, D. James Kennedy and uh, so many other uh, great religious figureheads in North America that uh, we can't depend on the government. The churches have to do it. And in order for the churches to do it, we need to set aside our doctrinal differences, unite on the points that we hold in common, and then force, by virtue of the American democratic process, the government to enact laws that will save society. You know, I understand there have been Sunday laws presented to recent presidents in, in the last three or four administrations, and they haven't signed them yet, urging, you know, there are already Sunday laws in the books. Why do you think that some of these stores are closed on Sunday and can't sell certain things on Sunday? They call them blue laws. How come they haven't gotten rid of that yet with all the separation of church and state? They're not going to get rid of them, friends. What they're going to end up doing is enacting more and activating the ones that exist. I'd like to read a quote to you from a book called Great Controversy that was written about over 100 years ago. There's a prophecy, in my opinion. Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power and under the influence of this threefold union, the country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling the rights of conscience. Same thing that happened with Rome in the Dark Ages. They're going to force people and tell people how to believe. Now, the spiritualism that the author here refers to is what I would call the charismatic movement. Spiritualism is an emphasis in the spirit. Do you realize that a few years ago, the phenomenon of speaking in tongues and the charismatic worship styles that are so popular now, they were called holy rollers. Any of you remember those days? They were thought of fringe Christians. Mainline Protestants wouldn't get anywhere near them. They sometimes would look through the window at their services and say, wow, look at that. They're rolling on the floor. That's why they call them holy rollers. Slain in the spirit. Now, keep in mind, friends, I first, when I became a Christian, attended these churches. And so I have a lot of regard and respect, a lot of loving people in all different fellowships. Amen? But most mainline Protestants would not have anything to do with it. Well, now... The charismatic movement and the phenomenon of, of speaking in tongues, what I think in many cases an un unbiblical technique of speaking in tongues, has swept the Protestant churches so that now Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopals, Catholics, Baptists, Lutherans have either entirely or in part or fractions of those churches accepted this. Well, I just read here, Protestants would be foremost in stretching their hands across the abyss. That's what happened. Then they would clasp the hands of Rome and under the threefold union... They would follow in the footsteps. Now, here are two books that you can get on the bookshelf right now. These are not old books like some I've quoted from. This is a book by a gentleman named Charles Colson. I had the privilege of meeting him, a fine Christian man. 
and it's called Evangelicals and Catholics Towards a Common Mission Together. And the theme of this book is that if we're going to save our culture, we need to lay aside our differences, unite on the points we hold in common, and work together. And I, you know, I agree with many of the things they embrace. I think what's happening with abortion is a travesty, in my opinion. I think that, I don't know if I deal with it the way some do. Don't misunderstand. I'm not a militant like that. But I also think that the crime, the pornography, pornography, primetime, television. I mean, you know, the society's become very decadent. A lot of perversion. Uh, there's a lot of uh, very sick things that are clamoring for rights, and they call it art in our culture. And I embrace many of the same things that they're talking about. But you know what? When a pendulum swings, it never stops in the middle. It usually keeps on swinging a little too far the other way. And in their attempt of uniting, and I think they're going to succeed, in their attempt to unite for the purpose of saving our government, Catholics and Protestants, I think they're going to say, hey, this is wonderful, and they're going to take it a few steps too far and get to the place where they start telling us how, when, and who to worship. One of the things they almost all hold in common is Sunday worship. Another book, Keith Warnier. He's a good friend of Pat Robertson. Matter of fact, Pat Robertson did the foreword here. It's called A House United, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, A Winning Alliance for the 21st Century. Uh, a number of interesting quotes in here. I don't have time to read it all to you, or we will not get through. Oh, no, we're not going to get through the lesson. i got 11 minutes left. Let me, read, let me read a couple of them here, if I may. Most, this is Chuck Colson's book. More generally, the spread of the charismatic movement among Protestants, songs, prayers, and worship styles going well beyond officially charismatic circles have done a great deal to reduce the barriers between Catholics and evangelicals, evangelicals being Protestants and charismatics. You know, that's one thing that I've noticed. Have you seen a change in worship styles in churches in recent years? Everything's a lot more touchy-feely, kinesthetic, instead of more formal, reverent worship. And I know some things needed changing, but remember what I said, the pendulum usually goes too far. You go to some churches now and it's bedlam. People get up there with hula hoops and everything else in the name of Jesus. And, you know, I, I think angels are offended by what sometimes happens in the name of the Lord. These are just a fraction of the books that are hitting the shelf that are talking about how we need to stop talking about our differences. The things I'm sharing with you in these meetings, friends, are not politically correct. I'll tell you right now. The politically correct thing to do is focus on what we have in common and not focus on the biblical differences. But friends, I think that God wants us to go by the Word and not what's popular. Amen? We've got to follow Jesus who is the Word. The Word, the truth will set you free. And the devil, don't forget, he's a shrewd operator. He's going to come in from the back door and it's going to sound so good that if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. Watch how quickly I go through these last few questions. Number eight, over what specific issue will force be utilized and the death sentence passed? You know what happened in Daniel chapter 3? It was the commandment that said, don't worship images, the second commandment. Daniel chapter 6, it's the first commandment. Worship the king or get thrown to the lion's den. Well, the devil takes one of the first four commandments. He doesn't care which one because he wants to be God. The commandments that deal with our relationship between worshiping God are the ones that bother him. And the Sabbath, the devil hates it because the Sabbath is a memorial that God is the creator and the devil can't create anything. And he wants us to honor him on his day, the day that light was made. And he's called the angel of light. And so he's trying to get people to substitute the first day for the seventh day, which is the one that God picked. Number nine, could a government really control buying and selling? You know what, friends? One of the things we're seeing that America is prominent in doing is called economic sanctions. They could not buy or sell unless they cooperate. How is America going to force that? America is the number one supplier for products in the world. Almost everywhere in the world you go now, they, uh, they speak. Man, I got so many of these things in here. I don't know which one to pull out. Credit cards are not the mark of the beast unless you don't know how to control them. <laughs> See that little magnetic strip on the back there? They're developing cards now. Matter of fact, they've got them out, and they're called super cards, and they have different names for them. And we're moving towards a cashless society. There's a lot of good reasons for doing it. For one thing, it's hard to mug somebody if all they've got is plastic and you've got your PIN number, it's going to be hard for people to steal your money. The government likes it because your transactions are all registered and it's easy to tax you. It knows how much you've really made. 
The supercards, now you just slide this through a magnetic reader. They're using these to monitor your attendance at work. You know, I used to punch a clock, slide your card through now. Uh, they're using these things to buy your products at the store. Do you have those in Michigan? Yeah, we've got them all over California. You buy your gas, you buy your fast food in California with a credit card if you want. Your gas, your supermarket, your fast food, um, of course, super, uh, um, department stores, everything. Now they've got one with a driver's license in California and a magnetic strip. It's got your whole driving record on it. They're developing a super card that will have your financial information, your work information, your driving information. And I suppose when they start making religious laws, they'll measure church attendance. And you go through, you slide your card through. If you're not attending on the day you're supposed to attend, you'll go to the market and slide it through. It'll say you can't buy, can't sell. Yeah, I, this is not the mark of the beast, but do I think they're going to use these things? Is the government set up to control buying and selling? Absolutely. They're doing it right now with economic sanctions on other countries that don't cooperate with American policy. Number 10, how strong and influential is the papacy today? Well, friends, there's no peer. By far, she is the strongest religi religious political power in the world, bar none. No, no one even has second place. The aim of the Pope is to unify the Christian world under the leadership of the papacy by the end of the century. Matter of fact, whenever he comes to North America, in his appeal, he's asking for separated brethren, meaning Protestants and evangelicals, to unite, come back to the Mother Church. That's what he calls himself. I think everybody here knows what happened now with Ronald Reagan and the Pope in trying to help overthrow communism. In 1982, Former President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II met for 50 minutes at the Vatican and constructured, uh, structured a plan to eliminate communism. This is found in the article called The Holy Alliance by Time Magazine. Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev said, everything that took place in Eastern Europe in recent years would have been impossible without the Pope's efforts and enormous role, including the political role which he played in the world's arena. Question number 11. How strong and influential is the United States today? With the fall of communism, Russia, of course, is broken and splintered, so they don't have the military might they had by, by far. They know that they're out of the ring right now. China is using very old and outdated equipment. After the Gulf War, the whole world kind of looks to America as the policeman for the planet. And we're going everywhere because we're, our weapons and our warfare were so impressive and sophisticated. Everybody saw our little video games we used to blow people up. And it just seemed like it was, there was no battle left anymore. Very, I don't think there's any hand-to-hand -hand combat anymore. It was also technical. Not only is America powerful as far as military might, the economy of North America drives the world. And again, I'm not being biased. These are the facts. Do you know that the economy of California is the 16th largest in the world? Just California. Not even counting all of North America. No matter where you go in North America. No, I'm sorry, no matter where you go in the world now, they drink Coke and Pepsi. They fight for Levi's. You can get a Big Mac almost anywhere in the world right now. You can go to the jungles and get a Big Mac now. McDonald's is almost everywhere, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. And they listen to Michael Jackson. You go to Japan, and they're going, Michael Jackson, and they don't even know what he's saying. It's the American superstars are the superstars everywhere now. America sets the trends for the world. Are you aware of that? That's a scary thought. A lot of it's because of our media industry. We pump out more movies and more television programming than anybody. I went to the Middle East and watched Gilligan speaking Arabic. <laughs> Tell you, that's a thrill. <laughs> Number 12. Is it clear that the influence and power of both the United States and the papacy are escalating with rapidity? What other factors could possibly set the stage for a worldwide law to execute those who refuse to violate conscience? Friends, in one word, fear. Economic disaster, natural disaster, medical disaster, plagues. People are going to turn to God out of fear. You know, when the stock market crashed a few years ago, uh, the, I think it was an 87 temporary crash, Someone said two things drive Wall Street, fear and greed. And you know, that's what drives most people. And those things could be a big factor that we don't see right now that are going to drive people to churches.
Who knows? Maybe we'll discover Noah's Ark and people will run to church because, hey, if Noah's Ark is true, you can believe the Bible, right? Anything could happen. Things we don't know, but I think it's going to happen quickly, friends, very quickly. Oh, I'm out of time, and I want, to, I want to say so much. If you went to the children of Israel two weeks, uh, let's say you went to them a month before they were crossing the Red Sea, and you said, you're going to be free in a month, they would have laughed. They would have said, no, we're going to have to form a political party, start lobbying against the Pharaoh, see if we can get him to enact laws, see if we can get some rights, raise our salaries, and become... It could never happen that fast. We've been here for hundreds of years. We've been slaves here. How could it happen in a few weeks? Sometimes we forget the God factor. God can accelerate things, can't he? And I think, friends, when the ball begins to roll, it's going to build up momentum, and we're going to be very surprised how quickly the end is going to come. Thirteen. As world conditions worsen, what will Satan do to deceive the masses? I think as the mass masterpiece masquerade he is going to seek to impersonate Jesus number 14 while interest in the counterfeit revival heightens what will be happening to genuine worldwide revival sponsored by God's end time people well you know what the Bible tells us where sin abounds in Romans chapter 5 verse 20 there doth grace much more abound and though the devil's going to intensify his spiritual efforts and a counterfeit revival, the genuine thing is going to hit God's people, and I'd like to think some of it's happening right here now, that God's Spirit and His Word is going to go forth and change people's lives because they're going to know what the truth is and get stirred up. How many of you have sensed God's Spirit working in your lives through this week, this month that we've been meeting together? Number 15, in desperation, the U.S.-led coalition will next decide to impose a death sentence on its enemies. What does Revelation 13, 13 and 14 say its leaders will do to convince people that God is with them? Well, they'll send the leaders forth. They'll do miracles going so far as even bringing fire down on the earth in the sight of people for the purpose of deceiving. Now, that's a very interesting statement. Fire, most of the time in the Bible, comes down as the result of God doing something. When Solomon dedicated the temple, the fire of God came down. The Spirit of the Lord filled the temple. When Moses built the tabernacle, the fire of God came down, consumed the sacrifice. The Spirit of the Lord filled the temple. Elijah prayed three separate times and fire came down as a result of his prayer. The Bible tells us on Pentecost, fire came down, a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire on the heads of the disciples filled with the Spirit. But you know there's a time in the Bible that the devil brought fire down too. You remember when Job became an issue and the devil said to God you're just protecting he just serves you because you protect him take away everything he has and the Bible says the devil brought fire down from heaven and devoured his flocks and his herds can the devil bring fire down for the purpose of deceiving he can't make life but he can make fire and I think that we're going to see a lot of counterfeit miracles this week I'll be demonstrating some things that will really stun you and I hope you don't miss anything this coming week. But uh, Satan can work miracles. Did the Pharaoh have his magicians cast down rods and counterfeit the miracles of Moses? The devil can work miracles, friends, and we're going to see things. That's why, oh, I'm pleading with you. Do not make your decisions based on what you see. The devil can make you see things. Do not make your decisions based on how you feel. The devil can make you feel things. Veggie burger can make you feel things. Make your decisions based upon what does the Word of God say. Amen? What does the Bible say? That's the only foundation Jesus said we should build on. These words of mine. That's the rock that does not roll, friends. That's the only thing that we're safe building on. Number 16. How can we be safe from powerful end-time deceptions? Well, I gave you the answer. Test everything by the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20 tells us according to the law and the testimony, the Word of God, the commandments of God, the law and the prophets, if they speak not according to this Word, there is no light in them. You know, I shared some of the Sabbath truth with a charismatic friend of mine. He said, Doug, I know if we go by the Bible, that sounds very convincing, but we have a new spirit. We're not under the law now, we're under the Spirit, and the Spirit is telling me that Sunday's the Sabbath. And so that minister told his congregation not to trust the Bible because it's the old dead letter. Go by the Spirit. 
Well, you know what? He probably is going by a spirit. But it's, I question what spirit is. Will the spirit of God ever tell you something contrary to the word of God? Or did Jesus say when the Holy Spirit comes, he will bring to your remembrance the things that I have said. Where do we find what Jesus said? In his word. That's where we need to go for our answers, friends. That's the only safe place. If you know that the word of God is trustworthy, then that's what you need to use to base your conclusions. And God's word is going to give us the answers we need because you're going to be challenged to defend your faith. And the promise of Jesus is the Holy Spirit will be giving you in that hour the very thing you need to say. Some of you are going to be brought before kings and rulers of the world to defend your faith. And even now, Peter tells us we need to be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks why we believe what we believe with meekness and fear. That's a paraphrase. Are you willing to worship and obey Jesus even if it means ridicule, ridicule, persecution, and finally the death sentence? You might be thinking, oh, Doug, I don't know how I can do that. You know, if you're following Jesus day by day, he'll give you grace when the time comes. I don't know if I could do it right now, but I don't have to right now, praise God. But when the day comes, I'm hoping sufficient unto the day, God's power will be here. Amen? And I'm trusting it's your decision to do the same. Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I hope you're learning new things from today's study. If you are, I'd like very much to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, your comments, and especially your prayer requests. Our office staff at Amazing Facts gathers every day to pray over each one of them. If you'd like to know more about how to obtain this video series, you can call us or write. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. And our toll-free number is 1-800-835-6906. Why don't you give us a call or write us a letter? God bless you, and I thank you in advance.